overeducated, underskilled. Maybe it's the other way around, I forget. And I'm obsolete. I'm not economically viable. Welcome to the podcast of Post Postmodern Madness and Societal Decay. Not economically viable. With your entropy coordinator and spirit guide Jay Swift. Greetings once more, dear listeners slash viewers. This is your host, Jay Swift, and you're officially knee-deep in the second episode of Not Economically Viable, the podcast slash vodcast of post-postmodern madness and societal decay. Our inaugural episode with Jim Goad was a rousing success, so much so that within 24 hours, it had already maxed out the bandwidth on our podcasting accounts. With that in mind, I suppose now is a good time to remind everyone that each and every episode of Not Economically Viable is published under Creative Commons Licensing which means any of you are free to download it or tape it off your computer like it was a radio station in the 1980s and just let the free information therein float around on the interwebs free of charge and send any threats of copyright retaliation on my part. Also, you can find every episode of Not Economically Viable online at youtube.com slash user slash jswiftmedia and then you can use some tertiary app on the net to download and let's do it that way. Anywho, we've got a really interesting guy on the slate for today's episode. I recently caught up with Anthony Jones, a San Diegan who made a documentary movie a few years back called Evil Law, which takes an in-depth look at sex offender registration laws, some of which he considers severely overbroad, brazenly unconstitutional, and quite possibly a basis for the federal government to vastly expand its power over all U.S. citizens. Well, how about we let Mr. Jones explain it himself and jump directly into the thick of things, huh? So this is uh, Jay Swift, as always, with Not Economically Viable, and today we have a very special guest on the program, all the way from San Diego, it is Anthony Jones, the director of Evil Law, who's also written a lot of other material about sexual offender registration in the U.S. So I'll just throw it to you and let you introduce yourself, you know, tell us about what you do and how you got into the field of uh, registered sex offender laws and penalties. Well, let me, let me throw a disclaimer here real quick, because any time you mention the word, I'll just use the abbreviation XO, okay, standing for sex offender. Weird out, oh, you're a, you're a defender, you're an apologist for child molesters, dangerous predatory sexual persons types. Well, I'm not. These people should have been castrated, locked up, and put in prison, and the keys thrown away, so... Anybody tries to put that label on me, sorry, pal. What I do is I, I am a researcher of, we're going to use abbreviations, it's much easier, of the SOR, Sex Offender Registry. I research and investigate the SOR itself, not basically who's on it. I mean, what's going on with the SOR? Okay, does that answer some questions? No, absolutely. And do you have a degree in this research, or is it just something you kind of appointed yourself on? Well, you know, this is, this is really going to, like I said, I actually wrote, it, what happened, how I got in this field of investigation, I wrote a book on it, it actually became a best-selling book. So this is how I got involved in investigating the S S O R. I live, I'm retired. I was a private investigator for about 40 years in my sessions. I live on a sailboat on the San Diego Bay. Don't pay any rent. Life is beautiful. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, one day, uh, a client of mine, two clients of mine, came to my boat with two teenagers. And I could take one look at their face that something was wrong. And I said, well, okay, guys, you should come aboard, have a seat, uh, hear some wine. Well, what's going on? Both of their, well... Both of their um, teenagers, one was, uh, I just call them Beaver, another one was Gidget, were on the sex offender registry. They were sex offenders. I said, what? I said, this is, oh, you are, this is a joke or something? Man, we have hit, we have hit the, the wine cap, man. And what, well, what had happened with these two, with these two teens was uh, Beaver turned 18, and he 
got the family heroin, which was an old 1960s hippie DW bus. Went to a beach in California with his girl, girlfriend. She was 17. And they did the wild thing. They got, you know, smoking weed, drinking beer, and playing music, doors music, and did the wild thing. Okay, that was very common back in the 60s, early 70s. Uh, they got busted. She got busted for indecent exposure in public. In California, indecent exposure in public can get you on the SOR. I wish I were making this up. I mean, well, here's where I got involved. What the parents find out was number one, the kids couldn't live in couldn't live in their homes because they were under jurisdiction of Jessica's law, which is law where if you're on if you're on the SOR, you can't live in so many thousand feet of a, of a school or a daycare or a nursery or a church or even a Toys R Us. So they have they had a, the kids had to move. It's unbelievable. So the parents they got married and the, the parents started paying for a, a, an apartment for them. And next thing you know, uh, vigilantes are throwing rocks, are throwing rocks at their apartment. Uh, you know, die, die, die. You know, they 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 have they couldn't find any place to leave, live. Uh, they couldn't get jobs. Uh, they couldn't. Um, uh, and they're basically banned and outcast from society. I mean, I, once again, I wish I were making this up. I'm not. I don't make this up. Then a serial killer started stalking. Me. There was a serial killer in, on the West Coast. It was going up and down the West Coast. And he'd go on these, uh, you know, these Megan's Public Law website and choose his victim. Oh, I like this guy here. I think I'll just go kill him. He'd, just, he'd, he'd track him down off their Megan's Law Public Law and, and, and that, kill him. Really murder, murder him. So the parents, now I've got these two teenagers on my boat. Here, and the parents are begging me, please, save, these sh- save our children. Uh, understand... When you're on the SOR, uh, you're basically in, you're living in a police world. You have to, you have registration rules, and regulations you have to follow. You, you know, you, you violate one of these rules and regulations, then you're arrested and you go to prison. You go to jail for violating the regulations. So technically, in California, I had a case where a guy was, was on the SOR for public urination, and he spent almost 10 years in prison because he kept violating his laws, regu- regulations. Like, you know, when you're on this thing, you have to verify, well, where you live, where you work, what kind of car you drive, where are you going? I mean, it, it, it's, it's something out of Nazi Germany. Uh, violate one of these rules, you go to prison. So I had to figure out how to get these people off of the Megan's Law Public website. So I finally figured out how to do that. It took me about six months to figure out how to legally circumvent all the, all the SOR Megan's Law website rules and regulations to get them off of the public website. Okay. Well, in the process, uh, I wrote a book about it. It's called An American Horror Love Story. It's, uh, you can go, you can Google it. Well, a Jew in Nazi, a Jew who survived Nazi Germany, Shlomo Goldstein, read this book and said, my God, my great, great grandson, Jason, who was on the SOR for doing the wild thing with his girlfriend was on it. And I met with I met with Shlomo. First of all, I thought it was a joke. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, a sex offender being in a time well, time parallel with a Jew in Nazi Germany, short of a gas chamber. I mean, that that's really that's kind of a weird out. So him and I sat in front of two computers. I was on one side of the computer, and he was on the other side of the computer. And first thing he would do is he would go to the Jewish National Holocaust Museum. Go check out that website. It's got all the documentations of what the Jews had to go through through Nazi Germany with pictures and images and explanations. First thing he, he clicked was I had to have a Jew, a, a, a letter, a, a sticker on the door of my house saying that a Jew lived here. Okay? My side, Megan's Law, the public website. I, and they dropped down. I had to have Jew on my driver's license. My side, Sex offender on driver's license and passports. We, we just kept going down the line. I'm going, my God, what is this? You know, number five, Jews, you know, vigilant, Jews being murdered at random. Dropped on my side uh, last year, there were 400 uh, SOs that were murdered by vigilants. So we just kept dropping and dropping and dropping. 
And that's where the uh, evil law documentary came from. But what was really scary was that he dropped down to the People's Court in Nazi Germany if uh, you committed a political crime or something politically or socially incorrect. You didn't go to a, a regular legal court. You went to a People's Court where judgment or sentence was passed on you. You couldn't make bond. And uh, you couldn't appeal it. Well, if an SO violates one of his regulations of being on the, you know, the, the sex offender registry, he is brought before a people's court. I mean, he doesn't go to a, to a regular court. He goes in front of a judge. He's a lot, he's a lot of attorney, but there's no bond. There's no, um, there's no jury. There's no appeal. I mean, the parallels, I mean, the parallels were just, just incredible. Well, uh, you mentioned something about uh, there's a $10,000 reward if anybody can disprove the documentation on this film. Once, uh, once the film was produced, Shlomo took it to the Jewish National Holocaust Museum and tried to get it shown there. He, he actually wanted this entered as doc, documentation that, uh, that w what was happening in the National Holocaust Museum was actually happening in America. And they saw one look at this, and they say, oh, I'm being sued. I'm, uh, the, the National Jewish Holocaust Museum is suing me for using their documentation. Understand, you go on their website, everything is copyrighted. So I use copyright, and all, all the films uh, on Shlomo's site are from the Jewish Holocaust National Museum. So I, I, got, I, I met the, the director, I said, I love it. I want to go to court. Let's get this in front of a jury. I can't wait. Well, long story short, they dropped the charges. They didn't want this for the jury. Okay. Anyway, so I'll have some questions. <laughs> this is what's going on with you. All right, absolutely. And I guess, you know, before we kind of get into some of the more granular details of what's going on as far as registration is concerned in the U.S., we really need to kind of iron out for people who may not be familiar with registration techniques. Uh, basically, you know, what the federal law is. I mean, going back to the Jacob Wetterling Act of 1994, what did that do on the national level as far as sexual offender registration? You know, how did that change state laws? Well, as someone who studied this astutely, trying to figure out how to get these kids loopholes around it, well, long story short, early 90s, uh, some guy kidnaps a 10 year old boy, the boy disappears, nobody knows what happens. Okay, the parents, the parents, uh, you know, go to their senators. And long story short, they pass a law that if you are a dangerous, predatory, you know, sex, sexual offender type, then you have to register with the police. It starts off at one state, and then it spread like cancer. Then all the states got it. And then, of course, uh, the Congress passed a law saying that all the states have to enact this. Okay. I agree with it. It was a good law. I mean, if there's a real sickle running around in society, you know, we need to put our need, need to keep tabs on this guy. So this is where it started. Okay, where it really snowballed was when Mega's Law would pass. Let me tell you what Mega's Law is. Okay, I've done a lot of research on this. You can Google it yourself. Uh, 1996, a woman named Maureen, Maureen Kanka lives in New Jersey. I mean, I hate to say this, but I'm just, I'm just going to take the gloves off. She was a low-life alcoholic. And she had her daughter go out and uh, sell Girl Scout cookies door-to-door -door to get money to buy her some booze. Now, think about this. She got a nine-year-old girl. Her name, her name was Megan. The mother orders her to go out in the neighborhood, knock on doors, and sell money for the school Girl Scout tickets so it can buy some booze. Unfortunately... May she rest in peace. I, I still feel bad about this. Oh, my God, this must have been horrible. She knocked on the wrong door. A nine-year-old girl in a neighborhood knocking on doors, knocks on the wrong door, and the, and the guy, the sicko, pulls her in, rapes her, and murders her. Okay. Once the, uh, the police find out what had happened, the neighborhood or the city was in an uproar, and they, was, they were going to charge uh, Maureen Kanka, Megan's mother, with child endangerment, and accessory to second degree murder. I mean, they, they were really hot about this. The, the, the city was hot about what, what this mother had done to her, her daughter. Well, uh, yeah, once, uh, once uh, let's see here. Well, what happened next was her defense was, she got a slip lawyer. Her defense was, it was 
not my fault this happened. It was the government's fault. The government should have told me that this sickle lived in my neighborhood. Had I known the sickle lived in my neighborhood, then I would have told my daughter, don't knock on this guy's door. So that is how Megan's Law was started. Okay. If you'll notice today, at one time, uh, I'm in my 60s. I'm sure a lot of people remember when Girl Scouts went out of neighborhoods and knocked on doors and sold cookies. Girl Scout cookies. cookies. That doesn't happen anymore. Now you see them in a group with, you know, with, soup, with uh, supervisors selling the, the Girl Scout cookies at like stores and public places. Now Walmart, Kmart, Target, that kind of stuff. So that's how the, uh, the Jacob Willing Law started, and that's how Megan's Law started. Uh, long story short, about a year ago, some guy in prison confessed confessed to uh, kidnapping uh, young Jacob, and there was nothing sucks in while he was a serial killer. Just wanted to kill a kid. And so, <laughs> all right, so ask away. Yeah, absolutely. And after that, one of the interesting developments is 10 years after Megan's Law came on board, we had the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act come along in 2006. And what that did was create a three-tier system for those who are SOs in terms of registration requirements. And can you tell us about the, the three tiers? You know, what qualifies for a tier one offense, that which requires about 15 years on the registration? Okay, well, yeah, listen, I'm, I'm probably going to very unpopular for a lot of your listening audiences. Uh, number one, Bill Clinton could be on the, uh, the SOR. As a matter of fact, there's a petition to get him on it. Okay, he's the one who signed Megas into, into law. Adam Walsh could, could actually be on the SOR because there's a video of him saying he met his future wife when she was 17 years old and he basically said we did the wild thing. All right. <laughs> okay. So now let's get out of the tiers. Uh, tier one is basically, uh, you know, public nudity, public action, moaning, streaking, skin dipping, uh, you know, so, I mean, silly so kids horse play with other and peanut was, you know, stupid stuff. Okay, no longer stupid anymore. Uh, sex things were, uh, you know, I, you know, if, if these cell phones would have been around when I was a teenager, I would have been doing it. You know, some some thirteen year old teen boy would take a picture of his, you know, what, and send it to his girlfriend. Oh, I mean, that that kind of stuff. Sex, any type of um, pornographic information transmitted over a cell phone. Sex things. Um, there was a case where a 14, well, you can Google, you can YouTube this, okay? <laughs> People who are not going to say this. There's actually a case where a 14 year old girl took off her clothes and put it on her Facebook page so she could get her boyfriend and she got arrested for, child, for distribution of child pornography. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's that's level one. Basically, all the silly, stupid stuff. Okay, then you get in the level, then you, get, then you drop down on tier two. Uh, at one time in this country, we had something called statutory rape. I know because I was charged with statutory rape. I was 16, she was 14, got caught in a wild thing, the past, got shit faced about it. I went from the judge, the judge looked at her and said, Did he force you? No. You love her? Yes. Do you plan on getting married one day? She said, Yes. I said, Yes. He said, Okay, get out of here. Love her. Have a nice life. So a judge would make a decision if, if you had consensual sex underage. It was a force, it was a rape, it was a love, you want to get married, you know, and, you know it makes sense. Of it. And generally, what would happen on a statutory statutory rape, it would either be a fine or a jail, you know, slap on the wrist or don't do it again, or I hope you had, I hope you get married and have a happy life, you know. Now there's no statutory rape. You go on, you go on the registry. I mean, there's cases of people, guys who are 18, are on the registry, not, pay, I mean, plenty of them, they're on the registry. And they're married to the woman that they molested. Okay, tell me what sense does this make? And then in their car, well, they can't they can't go to a school to pick up their kids. I mean, all the full blown mega law falls falls upon them, even though they're married to their so called victim. Uh, level two, uh, Romeo and Ju Juliet romances, school teacher, you know, high school kid. You know, once again, uh, the dream of every high school high school boy is to have get it on. A hot teacher. Okay, at one time, it was frowned upon. It was a well, don't do it again. Okay, well, this is unacceptable. Now, boom, you're on the registry. So, level, level two is basically, you know, 
uh, socially and politically incorrect relationships, which is the laughing stock of the world. Understand the age consent in Europe is 16, South America, South America, Mexico, 14, Asia, 13, Middle East, there is no age of consent. You can marry a one year old baby in, the, in Muslim countries. Uh, former uh, Russian Republic, Federal Republic, you know, like, uh, like, like Hungary, uh, let's see, all these countries at one time were part of the Soviet bloc. There was 14. Africa, 13. So technically, the whole world could be on the American SOR. Does this make any sense? <laughs> okay. Oh, of course. <laughs> all right, uh, now we drop down to level three. Level three, now this is what the law was really intended for. Somebody who is a dangerous predatory child molester. But what has happened? It, it, it you know, uh, it, it, it's it's really far out now. If you're if you're 18 and she's 14, well, you can be labeled. You know, it, it, it just it, it just morphed away from what it, it really was. Uh, you know, my 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 I, I, this this whole pure thing. Uh, Basically, what has happened is uh, America's puritanical past is now is now ruling from the grave. I mean, a lot of these American sex laws. I mean, you know, it's just they're, they're so out of touch, out of date with the rest of the world. Uh, my my thinking was, if somebody, what what should, what should, really should have happened instead of having an SOR, if somebody got caught doing something that was incorrect politically or socially incorrect. It should have been turned over to the psych psychiatric, to the mental health bureau. They, 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 should have been, they should have been labeled sexually deficient or, or sexually defunct or something like that. I mean, the, the, the mental health professional should have got involved with this. If you had to put somebody on a public website, it should have been, this is so-and-so, he's under treatment, his doctor is this. Doing good treatment, you know, it, it should have been a mental, it should have been a mental health issue. Whereas when they turned it over to the, the, the Department of Justice and made it a criminal act under the jurisdiction of the police, well, this this didn't solve any problem. I mean, basically, you know, I mean, the police can only react after a crime has com been committed. Whereas if somebody's out of the care and jurisdiction of a mental health professional or psychiatrist, well, this guy can get into his mind. And, and to get a feel what's going on. Uh, a good example was there was a case in California. And I, the name name escapes me. Where uh, the guy kidnaps uh, a ten year old girl, took her to his house. She was a sex slave for like fifteen years. They had three kids. He was on the registry, and they would have visited his house. You know, he made reports. I mean, he was doing everything he's supposed to do, but yet he had a you know he had a teenage girl. Held captain in his backyard was essentially having babies with her. So, you know, that's, had he done it because of a mental health professional, he could have spotted that out. That, that, that's kind of my, my, that's what I'm seeing, this whole thing, the whole thing uh, should have been turned over to the mental health profession, instead of the, instead of the criminal, with the exception of maybe violent rape. I mean, if you, any rape is a form of violence. Okay, that, that should have been criminal. But all this other stuff, uh, the, Department of Justice statistics shows that 95% of all child molestations occur between someone the child knows and trusts. The stranger danger represents like less than three or four percent. Okay, uh, whereas uh, supposedly, according to the SOR and registering that crowd, it's reversed. 90% of all child molestations are stranger dangers. Okay, it's just recently reversed. All right, that's, yeah, keep moving on. Next question, Jerry. Right, and one of the very interesting components of the 2006 law is it actually has a provision where you can actually be civilly committed without, not only without a trial, but also without having committed a crime. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, if anybody's ever read the book George Orwell's 1984, I and mean, this is strictly out of George Orwell's 1984, um, one thing that, that's not really noticed or really written about in George Orwell's 1984 is that the, uh, the sex police, I mean, basically his whole book is about illegal illegal uh, sexual contact with a woman that the state didn't, didn't, had, had justified or okayed. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, that, that, that's, you know, that's 1984. It's short. 19 George Orwell's 1984, and the Texas police are here. And two plus two is five is here. Well, what should, what should happen in a case like that is, you know, I I have a brother-in-law who's a psychiatrist, okay? If he were to tell me, hey, listen, man, this guy's dangerous, and this guy really needs to be locked up, I would go along with him. But if I have a cop say, yeah, well, this guy's dangerous, this guy needs to be locked up, well, I, you know, then I, hey, come on now, we, we need to have some, we need to have some documentation, we need, we need to have some information. Uh, we need to have psychological reports, you know. Um, understand, I'm back to evil law. That's what they did in Nazi Germany. They just, in, instead of civil commitment, it was called concentration camps. If they didn't like you, or if they, if they thought they didn't like you, they just put you in a concentration camp. You had no legal, uh, jurors, no, no legal process, due process. Okay, cop, get in the stand. We're taking you to a concentration camp. When you're going to get out, well, I don't know. Okay, so... Dangerous slippery, slippery slopes here. Um, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, in the book, um, she almost says that uh, former Goldstein, he said that this uh, this, mega, this this whole SOR thing, the registering people, this was, he said this is how Hitler took down Germany. Basically, when you put somebody on a, on a registration in a, in a, in a democratic Constitutional society, you're basically taking them out of the demo, out of the constitutional protection zone, and putting them in a government protection zone. You might have <laughs> this is this coming out right, or am I making any sense? <laughs> oh, of course. And one of the things I notice is when you look at the major three uh, laws that came into the U.S., each one added a new component to uh, sexual. Offender registration. Now, obviously, with the Wetterling Law, you had registration as a requirement. Then with Megan's Law, you had notification. And what Adam Walsh, that law did, was it added a third wrinkle, and that is monitoring of sexual offenders. Uh, so you can tell us a bit more about how that's changed over the last couple of years. You know, what are they doing now for people who are on registries like this as far as, you know, surveillance and other things? Here. Well, let me, let me you, you, you've asked me the question about expanding the law, what can get somebody on this registry. Okay. You have to understand that the, the government, and I'm starting to see this, and I'm starting to get more into it. And I, I'm not anti government, okay? I'm a libertarian, we need government, okay? Okay, not a half. <laughs> what I'm saying is that uh, you have to understand that governments get their money from the people. I mean, they don't make any products, they don't, they don't cut records, they don't make cars. I mean, you know, they don't build houses. The only thing they do is they provide a service, and they say, hey, we're providing this service, and we need your money, taxpayer money, to fund this service. The, governments are, the government, whether it be state, city, or federal, or local, uh, what they're doing is, if there is a socially, politically incorrect problem, uh, they figure, they, the, the, the thinking was, well, we can throw money at it to try to solve the problem, or we can try to monetize it. Monet I'm saying this word monetize, you're making money off of a off of a problem. Uh, states, states take in roughly $40,000 for every person that they put on the SOR. They get that from the federal government. Plus they get money from uh, you know, the states and the cities. Understand it takes, it takes money and manpower to put somebody on a registry. Um, you have the internet and website infrastructure. That takes money. Of course, law enforcement is probably the big bike. you got to have law enforcement go up to the guy's house say, Hi, are you Harry? Are you with here? Okay, thank you. Goodbye. And I say, uh, They go to your job. They go to your job. And you think it takes money to monitor and surveil, surveil, surveil someone. And of course, uh, it's a money maker. I mean, putting somebody on the registry for public urination, hey, this is. This is for cash card, you know, now you got forty thousand dollars a year for a guy that drunk, drunk and pissed in public. Okay, so they're always trying to, they're always lowering the bar. Uh, probably what will happen, probably about next year, you'll be calling me wanting to know about the fourth tier that's coming. The fourth tier, there's three tiers now. Now there's a fourth one. They're already doing it in California. What you're doing in California, and it's going to spread. You know, uh, monkey see, monkey do. If you are 
were applying for a job to work in a daycare, daycare, uh, daycare center, anything with children, or a teacher with children, you have to take, you know, I can't pronounce this, I still can't pronounce it, I'll just explain what it is, it's called a plomophony, pl- pl- <laughs> uh, pl- <laughs> polygraph test, that's where they're going to strap something on your penis or through a vagina, they're going to stick something up a vagina or uh, your rectum, whatever. And they're going to hook up to a polygraph machine, and they're going to show you weird pictures. And basically, they're going to look at the, how the needle, they'll show you a picture of a naked naked baby, the needle goes this way, then you're what is known as a latent, a latent uh, sexual possible offender. It goes this way, well, then you're cool. But if you fail this test, well, you know, they can't arrest you, they can't put you in jail, and they can't put you on the, uh, the SOR yet. But it would be that you failed, you failed a, a late sex offender registry test. Uh, this would be mandatory. Understand at one time in this country, fingerprinting was only for heart criminals. Not everybody's fingerprint. Drug testing was for heart, once they get heart criminals. Not everybody's drug testing. DNA samples, it starts off a heart criminal, but it's, it, it's morphing to everybody that's going to have their DNA, DNA check. And then, of course, this test, it, it, that'll be mandatory too. I have a job. Say, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have somebody strap something on my on my genitalia and, and show me pictures. Or, but are you wrong? Well, no problem. No job. Bye bye. <laughs> so get ready for that, folks. It's coming. Now, have there been any constitutional challenges to some of the requirements of these laws? Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, there's been a lot of lawsuits uh, filed on it. It actually went to the Supreme Court and. Uh, for some reason, uh, what has happened, and I'm seeing this, there's all, they say this, this, uh, this Magnus Law, the SOR Law, this is probably the most challenging law in the history of the country. I mean, it, it rivals the laws were filed during the civil rights protest days of the 1960s. But what happens is any time, I, I personally have filed all these lawsuits. What happens is when you follow these lawsuits, Judges or politicians are very leery about being labeled as a, you know, a child molester lover or you know, a polish or you're soft on child molestation. So, you know, like I say, anytime you hit, like I say, a politician, anybody, they don't want to get that term that I'm soft on child molestation because it's the end of their political or legal career. So they're always going to vote no when the, when the documentation is screaming yes. A uh, good example, good case in point, you're in here in San Diego, if you're on the SOR, you cannot get any kind of homeless shelter in the city. Uh, Shlomo, in the book, Evil Law, Shlomo said, yeah, during in Nazi Germany, Jews could not could get any, any, any homeless shelters. And I filed lawsuits on it, and the, and the best I could, the judge would come back with raw insufficient evidence or, or failure of the state claim, meaning he didn't want forward, he didn't want to touch it. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I don't, anyway, so the, these laws, they're, they're, drunk, they are, they're in direct violation of the Constitution. The Constitution stated that you can't try somebody twice for the same crime. Okay, now what's wrong with this picture? I'm back to the guy that's, uh, is on the registry for public urination and has spent almost 10 years in jail. For, not, not for committing any crimes, or not for urinating at home anymore, but for violating his, um, it's, it's SOR rules and regulations. Okay, and the way the states—you you ask the question, I'm going to answer it now. The way the way the federal government is able to regulate uh, people on the registry across state lines is that people who were on the registry came under a thing called the Interstate Commerce Clause. Meaning, you know, infra, you know, are you familiar with that Interstate Com- Commerce Clause? Ring a bell with you a little bit. Oh, of course. Okay, well, if you're on this registry, then you put that the federal government is able to you know, regulate you through the interstate commerce clause. You go to one state, you be this state, you go to that state, you have to register in that state. So now, the way they, the way they uh, keep track of everybody, back to evil law, uh, Shlomo told me that anytime he had to move or get a new job, he had to go to the stop and say, Hi, you know, I'm, I'm moving over here, and I'm going to be working here now. You know, and he had to carry a registration card. Uh, SOs have that have, have, have registration card on at all times. Uh, Shlomo said if he didn't have it, he'd be shot. You know, 
arrested on the spot. And so same thing, arrested on the spot. And the card has to be constantly updated. So insults have to do the same thing. And they have to go to state, they have to go to the local police department or the registry office. And on the, uh, but if so, if it's a police department, but the police department, hi, call officer, sorry, if I'm, uh, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, okay. Or anytime you buy a car, hi, I, I just bought a car, okay, cool. I got a new job, or this, or that, or I'm, I'm at a church, you know, you have to, you have to remind your whereabouts what you're doing. So I might do the same thing. But he had, he had, there's always a local Gestapo office there. Well, this is, once again, scary stuff, slippery, slippery snow. So, what we have here, uh, we, we, let me tell you, we're trying to get information from SORNA, which is the government agency in Washington State that, that, that regulates and uh, the uh, the act, Adam Walsh, Adam Walsh Act created SORNA. Go uh, on Google and Google SORNA, S-O-R-N-A, speak of this as a, a government bureaucracy. Uh, they use Homeland Security to monitor and track SSOs. Meaning, let's say you live in California, uh, you have to register if you're homeless, you have to register every 30 days. Uh, if you have a place every year and you disappear, then the, the Sheriff's Department in that city contacts SORA in Washington State, D.C., and say, hey, Bozo, Bozo the Clown, and Web, we don't worry that. Do they contact SORA? SORA contacts Homeland Defense. And Homeland Defense is both looking for you. Same thing with Nazi Germany. If you disappear, the Gestapo went looking for you. So, uh, slippery slope. Slippery slope. And then, like I said, the only crime you committed is you failed to write the register with uh, the registration procedures. Okay, do you have so any? Parallels, like I said, I don't think I'm back to $10,000 reward. Anybody can prove that the parallels between a Jew and Nazi Germany show the gas chamber. Versus an SO in America, a total gas chamber. And the parallels are scary. I mean, it's just right down the line. Uh, the way Shlomo got on, on, the way Shlomo became a registered person was it's called the, the Right Citizenship Act. I I, I've got that in the film where he says that once that act was filed, he was basically a non, he was a non-German. Well, under the the way that Joe. Uh, Welling Act, which is the, the SOR, you basically are non-American. I mean, you're basically banned and exiled from the American society. You can't get a job. You can't get. I was just reading a report today where um, a lot of jobs in America now are requiring that you have to have a license. Like in California, let's say you want to sell cars, you have a license, or you have real estate, a license. A license, you got to have a license for a lot of jobs now, which is basically a form of registration from the, from the state government. And you're being denied. You're being uh, license, being denied licenses to work. Uh, I had a case where someone was denied a license for, for a commercial driver's license to drive a truck because they were an SOR and they're on it for basically uh, skinny dick. Back in a pool, <laughs> okay, in a hotel room. They came out. They too much to drink and jumped in a hotel room. Today, how many states have complied with SORNA? Oh, it's all, it's mandatory. Even in these reservations, in these reservations, the even farms on America protected, like, like Puerto Rico or Guam. So if you're under, if you're under the, in, in, under the American flag, you have to, you, you know, you have to report that you're under the jurisdiction of this. Not only are you on the jurisdiction of it, now on the passport, if, you, if you're on the registry, you now have S, a big letter S, on your passport. Uh, Google J on passports in Nazi Germany. Same thing. And I'm, I'm getting feedback uh, that um, a lot of these countries are denying people that they have F, S on their passports. I mean, if you have S on your passport, uh, you can't go to one. A lot of countries will say no. And the way you're tracked, once you try to leave the country, and let me tell you who monitors you and watches you and tracks you. You leave the country 
was a password called Pass Interpol. Interpol is now in charge of monitoring, monitoring, monitoring and watching. Whereas under Nazi Germany, it was a Gestapo. And of course, Jews had J on their passport. And there were a lot of countries they, they couldn't go to. They were basically stuck within their country. So people on the register are now basically stuck in their stuck in their they can't leave. You can't go to Canada. You can't go to Mexico. We're, you know, the only way out is to get on a plane and try to find a country where you can go, which are now far and few between. And do you have any Back hard to the parallels? Yeah, and yeah, and do you have any hard data on the law's impact on recidivism and perhaps some of the economic consequences of people being placed on these registries? Uh, yeah, you can Google this. Uh, if, you, if you Google uh, recidivism uh, of, of an SO, Department of Justice Statistics, not my statistics, not Joe Blow's statistics, the national, the national recidivism rate for, for SOs Jumbo, 3.1%. Okay. The next lowest recidivism rate is murder. Meaning somebody murder someone, there's, there's a 2.9% they're going to murder again. Okay. Now, when you compare the recidivism uh, recidiv rates for the other crimes like burglary, all theft, drug dealing, kidnapping, you know, there's no use there. I mean, you get up in the 15 67% recidivism. Okay, whereas with, with, the, with the SO, you, I mean, they're treating this, they're basically treated like they're in the 67% recidivist uh, rate. Okay, once again, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> okay, so anyway, go to 3.1, 3 3.9 3 uh, rate, and then most of these times when they do reoffend, uh, it's not, it's not rape or sexual violence or, or this or that. We're back to this socially and politically correct. It's some guy or some woman doing the wild thing with somebody underage or on a beach or in a treehouse or, 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 you know, or in, a, in a telephone booth. You know, like, so it's, not, it's not a violent reoffense. It's just breaking, it's just breaking America's logical sex laws. Uh, yeah, can you give us an example of perhaps someone who's been listed on a registry who was later civilly confined under one of these laws? Who was civilly confined? Who was on the registry and civilly confined? Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically what happens there is, uh, like I said, once again, I go back to my, you have to look at uh, sex crimes as a crime, as a mental, mental defect, a mental issue, a mental illness. You have to look at it from that point. And, I mean, just put it, I mean, let's, put it, let's say someone's mentally retarded. Okay, they're mentally retarded. Okay, they say, well, we're going to push him in prison for five years of being mentally retarded. Okay, the guy does five years in prison, and you let him out of prison, he's still mentally retarded. Nothing's changed. Okay, if somebody, if somebody is deemed to be you know, mentally ill, then that need, person needs to be put in a mental institution. We put criminally insane people, if you're, if you're, Diagnosed as being criminally insane, criminally insane, you know, you go on a mental institution forever. Bye bye. Okay, and this is what happens when you don't you don't treat a symptom correctly. It's a mental, it's a mental disorder. Let the mental health department take care of it. If it's a criminal matter, like I say, a violent rape, yeah, I'm gonna draw the line on that. That's violence. Okay, violence, yeah. Then then let law enforcement or the, the legal system take care of it. Okay, an 18 year old and a 7 year old doing the wild thing. sense to me. All right, and moving along here, when you look at the issue of sex offenders, I mean, obviously it does happen. There's been some very, very big stories lately. I mean, for example, just in Los Angeles earlier this year, you had 28 people, or, well, 28 child slaves rescued from an operation. Uh, operation Rescue in Europe actually found... How are we doing here? Oh, can you hear me? 
Oh, can you hear me? Oh, can you hear me, sir? Ah, so I think I know you're starting to see why I prefer doing things on Skype. Okay, come again? Yeah, this is usually why I do uh, interviews on Skype or on Google Hangouts. You're just less uh, static, and it's... Well, yeah, I don't want to vote. That's the problem I have. I'm at kind of mercy of what I have. So. Right. Anyway, did you get my last answer, or did I get cut off like I gave them all? Yeah, we got that in there. All right, so what's the next question? Go ahead, here. All right, so moving along, I mean, obviously, you know, Sexual offenses happen all the time. I mean, there are some big problems going on. Obviously, in L.A., you had 28 children rescued over this year. Uh, you had Operation Rescue in Europe found 70,000 members strong, uh, you know, global sex trafficking ring. So if registration and monitoring and notification isn't the solution to that problem, what do you think should be done? Well, okay, if you were like I said, I've always said that... Uh, you have, to take, you have to look at that's a demon either should go to the mental, mental health professionals or should go to law enforcement. Okay. At this point, we don't have that. All the cases go to law enforcement and the legal system. Uh, as far as sexual, uh, you know, sex trafficking, yeah, that, that's, that should go to law enforcement. Okay, so I mean, somebody trying to make money um, but pepping out a young girl, yeah, this guy needs to do some serious prison time. Okay. Also, the, uh, the the guy that's uh, that's just paying to have you know do the wild thing with the thirteen, fourteen, but he needs to do time too. Okay, this is this is this is criminal activity. Okay, that's that's my that's my calling on it. And a lot of grandstanding here in San Diego every year. They have, they have a they have a thing called Operation Blue. That's where they'll take all the policemen, they'll take fellow officers, uh, U.S. Marshals. And we'll go to all the houses of all the SOs and knock on the door and check them out. Okay, this is just political grandstanding. You know, they understand that it costs a lot of money. I mean, it's 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 multi billions of dollars a year to, to monitor these people. They have to show they're doing their job. You know, it's using the fear factor. Yeah, and uh, you know, one thing. Well, you uh, oh, go ahead. What we got here? Yeah, and moving along just a, just a little bit. Wow. One of the oh, can you hear me now, sir? Yeah, I'm still here. So go ahead. Okay. Yeah, one of the things you brought up in the documentary that's very interesting is that now we're starting to see states use the model laid out for sex offenders for entirely different kind of registries. So can you give us a couple of examples of the non-sexual offender registry states have opened up since I Megan's Law came online? Want to try again? I didn't quite 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 hear you. Yeah, absolutely. So, one of the interesting things you brought up in the documentary is that since Megan's Law has come online, states have actually enacted several new registry laws modeled after Megan's Law and other sex offender registration laws. Can you tell us about those and how they, you know, compare to those? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. So yeah, one of the interesting things that you mentioned in the documentary is that many states have actually created new laws and new registries modeled on Megan's Law and other sex offender registries. Can you tell us about some of the things states have been doing outside of sexual offenders in terms of regulating and putting people on registrations? Okay. Well, you know, Shlomo, Shlomo warned me about this. He explained that in Nazi Germany, it started off with the registration of the Jews first. Yeah, that's how it starts off. Basically, Hitler said, "Well, we have to protect we have to protect German society from these people because they're a danger to children and people." And of course, but of course, then we have to we have to take them out of a constitutionally protected zone, and you know, basically, we take away most of the constitutional rights, and put them in a non not uh, a government protection zone, which is a non non uh, uh, constitutional zone. And we can do whatever we want with them. All right. So this movie was made, I, 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 me and Shlomo made this two years ago, and uh, the new registries have really steeped. Shlomo said it was going to come because it happened in Germany, not in Germany. As it stands now, Utah, Utah has the financial fraud registry. 
that are, you know, it was basically for the Bernie Madoffs. So Utah Financial Fraud Registry, uh, public website. Tennessee, animal cruelty. Any kind of animal cruelty to animal cruelty, land animal, once again, registration, public website. New York, Harris website. That, that's wide open. And, you know, George Washington could have been considered a terrorist. Uh, South Dakota, DWI official chalk. Meaning if you live in a neighborhood, you can now go, you can now go to your friend's website and see who's DWI, on a DWI in your, in your neighborhood. Uh, California, arsonist. Okay, also drug dealer and drug user. We'll have two more of these things here. Well, what's happening is pretty soon everybody's going to be on this is gonna, you know, everybody's going to be on some type of registry. And what I'm seeing with the registries are small this type of, oh uh, yeah, Washington State kidnapping. What's happening with the arsonist registry? These registries, I've looked, I've looked at them, and I've actually looked at the registries themselves, and you'll see it's all spin off of the sex offender registry. And sex offender registry is used as a template. And these other registries are, are basically spin offs from them. And also, the laws uh, to get on these registries now, it, it's just like the sex offender registry, starts off as a really dangerous, you know, heavy, Heavy dude, and then, then the laws are expanded, expanded, like with the sex center, to the point where public urination gets you on, gets you on. On uh, nervousness, you, you now get all this thing for throwing a lit cigarette out of a car, or not putting a campfire out. Uh, there's one guy put on it for taking this, the batteries out of a smoke detector. Okay? Uh, the Washington State Kidnapping Registry, uh, Child Custody Chiefs. If you had this auto for the weekend and you decided to keep it a little bit longer, now you go on that registry. Uh, you know, it's, it's like I say, it, it, I, I'm predicting, uh, I'm predicting about 25 more of these registries pretty soon. Also, um, yeah, uh, and that's what happened not to Germany. If you're a, a political activist, not to Germany, you want to register. If you're a communist, you want to register. If you're a Catholic, you want to register. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you want to register. And let's start putting everybody on registries. That's how you control somebody within a constitutional democracy. Uh, that's, this is the danger. And like I say, uh, I've said many times that uh, the Jacob Whirling Law and Mega Law, these are, these are anti-democratic Trojan laws. Uh, I understand how Hitler was able to take down democratic Germany and turn it into national socialism. Everybody that's against them, they got to put out registers. So moving along, I mean, obviously, you know, Sexual offenses happen all the time. I mean, there are some big problems going on. Obviously, in L.A., you had 28 children rescued over this year. Uh, you had Operation Rescue in Europe found a 70,000 members strong, uh, you know, global sex trafficking ring. So if registration and monitoring and notification isn't the solution to that problem, what do you think should be done? Well, okay, if you were a like I said, I've always said that... Um you have to take, you have to look at, at bats and demons either should go to the mental, mental health professionals or should go to law enforcement. Okay. At this point, we don't have that. All the cases go to law enforcement and the legal system. Uh, as far as sexual, uh, you know, sex trafficking, yeah, that, that's, that should go to law enforcement. Okay, so I mean, somebody trying to make money on a pep not a young girl, yeah, this guy needs to do some serious prison time. Okay. Also, the, uh, the the guy that's uh, that's just paying to have you know do the wild thing with the thirteen, fourteen, he needs to do time too. Okay, this is this is this is criminal activity. Okay, that's that's my that's my calling on it. And a lot of grandstanding here in San Diego every year. They have, they have a they have a thing called Operation Blue. That's where they take all the policemen, they take fellow officers, uh, U.S. Marshals. And we'll go to all the houses of all the SOs and knock on the door and check them out. Okay, this is just political grandstanding. You know, they understand that it costs a lot of money. I mean, it's, it's, it's multi billions of dollars a year to, to monitor these people. And they have to show they're doing their job. They're always using the fear factor. Yeah, and, uh, you know, one thing well, you uh, 
Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, and moving along, just a, just a little bit. Wow. One of the, oh, can you hear me now, sir? Yeah, I'm still here, so go ahead. Okay. Yeah, one of the things you brought up in the documentary that's very interesting is that now we're starting to see states use the model laid out for sex offenders for entirely different kind of registries. So can you give us a couple of examples of the non-sexual offender registry states have opened up since Megan's Law came online? I didn't quite, quite, quite hear you. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the interesting things you brought up in the documentary is that since Megan's Law has come online, states have actually enacted several new registry laws modeled after Megan's Law and other sex offender registration laws. Can you tell us about those and how they you know, compare to those? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. So yeah, one of the interesting things that you mentioned in the documentary is that many states have actually created new laws and new registries modeled on Megan's Law and other sex offender registries. Can you tell us about some of the things states have been doing outside of sexual offenders in terms of regulating and putting people on registrations? Okay. Well, you know, Schlomo, Schlomo warned me about this. He explained that in Nazi Germany, it started off with the registration of the Jews first. Yeah, that's how it starts off. Basically, Hitler said, well, we have, to protect, we have to protect German society from these people because they're a danger to children and people. And, of course, but unfortunately, we have to, we have to take them out of a constitutionally protected zone. And, you know, basically, we take away most of the constitutional rights, put them in a non, not a, a government protection zone, which is a non-constitutional non, uh, uh, zone. And we can do whatever we want with them. All right. So, so this movie was made, I, 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 me and Shlomo made this two years ago, and uh, the new registries have really steeped. Shlomo said it was going to come because it happened in Germany, not in Germany. As it stands now, Utah, Utah has a financial fraud registry. That are, you know, it was basically for the Bernie Madoffs. So Utah financial fraud registry on you know, a public website. Tennessee? Animal cruelty, any kind of animal cruelty to animal cruelty, to any animal, once again, registration, public website. New York, terrorist website. That, that's wide open. And, you know, George Washington could have been considered a terrorist. Uh, South Dakota, DWI habitual chalk, meaning if you live in a neighborhood, you can now go, you can now go to your friend's website and see who's DWI, on a DWI in your neighborhood. Uh, California, arsonist. Okay, also drug dealer and drug user. About two more of these things here. Well, what's happening is pretty soon everybody's going to be on this is gonna, gonna, everybody's going to be on some type of registry. And what I'm saying with the registries are as well as the state, oh yeah, Washington State kidnapping. What's happening with the arsonist registry uh, these registries, I've looked, I've looked at them, and I've actually looked at the registries themselves, and you'll see it's all spin off of the sex offender registry. And sex offender registry is used as a template. And these other registries are, are basically spin offs from them. And also, the laws uh, to get on these registries now, it, it's just like the sex offender registry, it starts off as a really dangerous, you know, heavy, heavy dude, and then then the laws are expanded, expanded, like with the sex center, to the point where public urination gets you on, gets you on. On nervousness, you, you now get all this thing with throwing a lit cigarette out of the car, or not putting a campfire out. Uh, there's one guy caught on it for taking the, the, the batteries out of a smoke detector. Okay? Uh, the Washington State Kidnapping Registry, uh, Child Custody Chiefs. So if you have your daughter for the weekend and you decide to keep a little bit longer, now you go on that registry. Uh, you know, it's, it's like I said, it, I'm predicting, uh, I'm predicting about 25 more of these registries pretty soon. Also, um, yeah, uh, and that's what happened in Nazi Germany. If you're a political activist in Nazi Germany, you want to register. If you're a communist, you want to register. If you're a Catholic, you want to register. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you want to register. And let's start putting everybody on registries. And that's how you control somebody within a constitutional democracy. Uh, that's, this is the danger. Like I say, uh, I've said many times that uh, the 
Jacob Willing on, and they just thought these are, these are anti democratic Trojan laws. Uh, they take down democratic Germany and turn it into that, national socialism. Everybody that's against them, they got to our registers. In the documentary, you suggested that Megan's Law and its uh, subsequent legislation and the lock will eventually lead to half of all Americans living in what you called government-controlled zones as government-registered citizens. So what exactly do you mean by that? Well, let's just look at some interesting facts. I mean, I don't make up facts. Everything I say can be, can be Google or documented. Okay. As it stands now, uh, the Center for Missing and Exploited Children on their website, one of how many people are on this are on this site, and it's almost nine hundred thousand people. Well, let's 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 break nine hundred thousand or nine hundred thousand people down to the population of America, which is three hundred sixty people. That's one in every three hundred. Basically, one in every three hundred person is on a registry. That that breaks down to one person you meet on a daily basis is on this registry. Also, this is the population. Of a state like I'm really from Alaska, the population of Alaska is like 700,000 people. Uh, population of Montana, 800,000. Uh, Wyoming, 900,000. I mean, basically, have I mean, what, what this thing you said that you have the population of a state, of an American state, where everybody in the state has now been taken out of a constitutionally protected zone, meaning when their constitutional rights are violated, they have no legal re resource. And they've been placed in a government protection, non corruption solution zone where the government says, not says, it dictates where you can live, where you can't live, where you can work, what you can go. You have to report everything about you and what you do in your life to us. I mean, this is Nazi Germany. This is what people went to in Nazi Germany. Hey, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like promoting your documentary? It seems like you've had some troubles with what you consider censorship. So, what's been going on there? Oh, oh, yeah, big, yeah, big, big time here. There's uh, what I'm saying here is I, I'm not, I'm not being billed as telling, telling, telling people things they don't want to hear. Uh, Amazon. I didn't realize it was owned by Amazon. It's called uh, IBMD. You know, you've got movie stars. If you're a movie star, you get a list on this, who you are, what you're doing, what's happening. It's kind of like a Facebook for movie, for the movie star Hollywood crowd. Okay, I tried to get on it, and they said, no, you know, we're not going to put this up. And then Amazon has a thing called video, where you can put videos up. So tell your video, download. Okay, Amazon said, no, you're not, no, we're not doing this. So I had, I had to find an independent video, uh, video downloader where I could actually offer my video for sale to download it's only a buck. I'm not trying to get rich off this. And a lot of the, uh, I tried to advertise this, advertise it, and I couldn't advertise it. Do you have any coast to coast AM fans out there that like listening to George Noy, Art Bell? I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of this radio show comes all late at night. Even they refuse to let me let me advertise it on your show. Uh, there was only one uh, video downloader that would actually accept this. Okay, video, uh, Amazon turned it down. A host of other video places that, you know, we put a video up and so the download turned it down. Uh, I tried to advertise it in newspapers. Wouldn't, wouldn't take it, wouldn't take a dime for it. And this is really sad. Okay. Uh, have you ever heard of a show called Coast to Coast AM? Art Bell, George Norrie comes on late at night. Uh, I've listened to it many, many times. Well, you're not going to like this. I've listened to this show for about 20 years. I actually personally know Art Bell. All right. That was, I was actually a guest on his show. God, I hate doing this because I love these people. I love these people with that fast. But Coast to Coast AM, George Norrie, Lisa Lyons, Tom, they all tonight be advertising this film on their show, on their radio show. Now, when some, when, a, when, a, when a business refuses to take your money, especially a show like Coast to Coast AM, just really got me thinking. And I like to say, once again, George Nori, I love you, bro, but you know, you're, you're wrong on this one, man. You're really wrong, George. Really need to look in the mirror and ask yourself, why are you, why are you uh, banning this? Anyway, said my piece here. Uh, there was a case where someone in Arkansas, a city in Arkansas, saw the film. 
and he hung, he actually flew a Nazi flag off of his house, and the, the town went ballistic over this. The court was fighting it. I contacted all the local media in that area, and tried to advertise this film, saying, listen, man, this guy is, this is why he's doing this. And once again, no reply. So, what I have is, it's called, that's what they, what they practice in America, it's called censorship through omission. And it's alive and well in this country. I can verify it. Ah, and that's a definitely a good go-home note if I ever heard one. Now, we hear it not economically viable. We believe everyone should have an equal opportunity to get their voice heard, no matter how controversial or contentious or countercultural. So if any of our listeners or viewers would like to actually check out your movie or read your books, where should they go? Well, uh, the movie is uh, just uh, www.evillaw.pk. The reason I went with TK because that's an uh, anonymous URL provider. When you have something controversial, somebody can do a, if you, if you use it like a dot com, somebody can do who is, find out where you're at, next thing you know, man, I got creepy, creepy people on my lawn. I mean, I got the, the, the car with the black tin and went all the guys in black suits looking at me. At least with TK, I remain anonymous. So that's what that's for. Uh, an American Horror Love Story. I originally put this up on, it's on Amazon, but the trolls, I call them the trolls, just trashed it. Trashed it to death, so I took it over to Scribd. S-C-R-I-B-D, Scribd. So American Horror, American, American Horror Love Story, or, you know, Scribd. Uh, you, you, can, you can Google it. Uh, it's become a bestseller on Scribd. Amazon, you know, one of the defects in Amazon putting a book up, if you have something controversial, the trolls trash you, next thing you know, nobody wants to read it. Oh, this is good, you know. But anyway, if anybody, any, if we got any Coast to Coast, anybody, any members of the Coast to Coast family, you need to email Jordan Norton and say, hey, what's going on? Why are you banning this? Uh, I, I, I emailed Art Bell. He said, well, if I was on, let me tell you, I, I, I would have this on there. Of course, you know, he's retired. Yeah, this is the final question. I just want to give you the final word, you know, just moving forward. I mean, where do you see these laws going in the future? I mean, are we at a point where we're going to start seeing them scaled back a little? Or do you think the public momentum is going to make them more, you know, severe and restrictive as the years go by? I would say in the next 20 years, the way, the, the way these registrations are expanding and the way, the, the way the, you know, the bar is being lowered on what gets you on these registrations, you'll come home, you'll flip on your, on your computer, and you'll see basically everybody, everybody is on some type of registration website in your neighborhood. And it's going to get, it's going to get like Nazi Germany, where something like 75% of the people were on some type of registration and 25% not. So as it stands now, I predict the future where uh, not being on a government registry will, will, will make you kind of weird. You'll, you'll be a weird person. You might, have got a, you might have got a registry. I mean, basically, I mean, actually, you know, um, doing an interview like this could put you on some type of registry, a future, a future registry. Well, you know what? At least I got good company, right? <laughs> All right, once again, yeah, once again, I want to thank you so much for taking time to to talk to us today, Mr. Uh, Jones. You got your website. The documentary is called Evil Law. Check it out and uh, just do your part to commit thought crime. You know, that's what makes America great. All right. And contact George Norrie at Coast to Coast AM, man. Give him a piece of your mind for, for, for not, not hosting or not having me a guest. Once again, we here at Not Economically Viable would like to thank Anthony Jones for his participation on the program. If you want to check out Jones' movie, you can head on over to evillaw.vhx.tk. And if you're interested in reading some of his published endeavors, all you got to do is type his name into the search bar at scribd.com and you'll get an eyeful. Scribd or scribed? Well, either way, you know how to spell it. Don't worry about it. Well, that's all we've got for you this time around. And as always, if you have a particularly unusual, unorthodox, or unpopular view on contentious, controversial, and challenging issues and matters, and you don't mind having your opinions thoroughly raked over a public forum, feel free to drop us a line and we might just invite you as a guest on the program. If you like what you hear, do us a favor and subscribe, like, share, forward, and retweet our show. After all, chronicling the slow erosion of social cohesion and normalcy is unquestionably 
a group project. 